Even back in high school during the height of my college confidential days, graduate degrees had been a huge topic of discussion for students trying to figure out the next move within their careers. Now, not everybody wants to spend five plus years becoming some kind of doctor, but it can hardly be denied that having some kind of postgraduate education can significantly increase your career opportunities. But even after you've decided that you want to accelerate your career by attending grad school, it can be difficult to decide what degree prep you want to pursue and what schools you want to apply to in time to take the classes and do the extracurricular activities that will set you apart from other applicants. Honestly, even after you've been accepted, it can be difficult to balance and prioritize everything in those two years of your master's program. What's up y'all, it's Afueco. If you're new to my channel, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, I wanna say first and foremost that I'm sorry for being so inconsistent and taking so long with certain video requests, but I'm getting back on it. The PhD is rough even though i really love the research sometimes i feel like why am i still doing this and you may be an undergrad right now trying to decide whether or not you want to do a phd or any graduate program for that matter most people probably won't pursue a phd because it is a significantly longer time commitment but a master's degree is quite a bit shorter of a time commitment that can also significantly improve your career outcomes grad school is obviously a significant financial and time consuming decision but the return on that investment can be really high the skills you're going to gain as a grad student are huge you're taking more classes. Typically those classes are more difficult and you really focus on the depth of your field. With a graduate degree, you become a professional, if not an expert, at whatever field of study your graduate degree may be in. These additional skills can come with amazing career upside, so many people spend one to two years finishing up a master's degree to gain more skills and make more money. So today we're going to take a dive into the master's degree. One caveat that I will throw out there is that I am a computer scientist and I did all of my degrees in computer science and electrical engineering, so this is really applicable for that field, but it does have a lot of parallels in many other fields, especially the engineering field. In some of my old videos, I talk about this, but when I was a senior at Stanford in computer science, instead of just finishing up my requirements and graduating, I decided to start taking graduate level classes and apply to the co-terminal master's program in electrical engineering. And luckily I got in because if I had not gotten in, I wouldn't have graduated undergrad that year. This degree allowed me to begin pursuing my master's degree at the same time as I was finishing up my bachelor's degree in computer science. Similar programs like this exist at other schools, like the MEng program at MIT, which allows students to earn a bachelor's and a master's degree in five years, either simultaneously or sequentially, and many times they're also able to participate in research, but other programs allow for fully coursework-based degrees. In terms of requirements, standard master's degrees in science and engineering typically have the same set of requirements as their co-terminal equivalents, but co-terminal degrees allow you to do this faster if you plan ahead during undergrad. My co-terminal master's program was a coursework-focused program that allowed me to just take additional classes to finish up my degree and graduate with a master's degree around the same time that I would graduate with a bachelor's degree. Usually you can graduate with both degrees during your fifth year. This is typically for people who have planned ahead and have taken the appropriate classes throughout their undergraduate career, but I actually graduated with my undergraduate degree during that fifth year and then graduated with my master's degree the year after. I think it's really important to understand and look at these degree programs so you understand what your timeline is to graduate. Timelines are extremely important for grad school from the application to making sure that you're completing your degree requirements. And we can actually compare my co-terminal master's degree with the standard master's degree from Stanford Electrical Engineering. Let's start with my co-terminal master's degree in electrical engineering. I did apply around 2014, 2015, but the requirements are pretty much the same as they are today. The requirements are pretty straightforward and laid out for you as a student. It requires a total of 45 units to graduate and you need to maintain a 3.0 GPA. 12 units have to be in one specific depth, which is typically the area you are focusing in and want to become an expert or professional in. Then there are additional nine units in other areas. That is to give you a broad understanding of the field. And then there are 15 units of technical electives to learn whatever you choose to learn in other techie fields. I just chose to take more computer science classes. And then you need to complete nine more units, which can be in almost any 100 plus level class so it doesn't even have to be engineering. Now looking at the master's degree for students who are not co-term, there are many similarities. The unit requirements are the same, you need 45 units of coursework, but you can also see here that there is an additional option to obtain a distinction in research. And this means that you have a faculty advisor who's guiding you through the process of research for a problem that you're interested in within your field, and it adds a few more requirements. Specifically, you must commit 50% of your time over three academic quarters to research, independent study coursework, 
work, combinations of those two, or other external research experiences or fellowships. And you must also produce writing on the research you conducted, and it culminates with a thesis. The research within that thesis must be of journal or high quality conference publishable quality. So essentially, it's like a slice of what you would do as a PhD student. In summary, I actually think the real split between types of master's programs are those that are coursework based and those that have a research focus. Stanford actually allows for either experience, but certain programs require research, so it's important for you to do your own research on any program you're interested in. A research focused master's program might care a bit more about your statement of purpose, but let me not get ahead of myself. We'll talk about the statement of purpose when we hit application requirements. So now that we understand what the degree requirements are for a specific master's program, let's actually dive into the application itself. Application requirements are typically pretty standard across the board. You have to send in your academic record and GPA history, any required test scores, which can be the GRE or GMAT, depending on what program and school you're applying to. You need to have other people submit letters of recommendation for you. You have to submit your resume or CV sometimes, and then you're typically almost always required to submit a statement of purpose. Sometimes it feels extremely random the way admissions goes. People with very similar applications can get rejected or accepted at the same school. For my PhD cycle, for example, I was rejected to every safety school that I applied to and I got accepted to two out of the three of my top schools. Admissions is really based on how you will fit into the school. My research interests actually aligned way more with labs at MIT rather than labs at the safety schools I had applied to. This is specifically for the PhD, but I think this also applies to grad school in general, especially the master's degree. Generally, admission officers want to know that you will contribute effectively and be successful at their school. Most schools want the best and the brightest, and while your test scores and your grades matter, your articulation articulated motivation can have a huge impact on whether or not you're admitted into the school. That is that statement of purpose that you're writing. And that can also be reflected in the letters of recommendation that others write for you. So make sure the people that are writing your letters of recommendation actually think highly of you. But it's really important to make sure that your statement of purpose specifically is tailored to the school that you're applying to. Make sure that you connect your experiences to the programs and activities that admissions at that institution will offer you. Show how admissions to that institution will directly advance your career goals. Of course, talk about your strengths and positive experiences, but also humanize yourself. Show all the ways that you've grown and the challenges you've overcome, and show how those challenges have shaped the scholar that you are today. Don't feel the need to be overly humble and aggressively show off your accolades, really just be yourself. If you're thinking about this and you've watched videos on college admissions before, you probably get the point, but really don't be afraid to seek out resources to help start your essays or your application in general, either at the school that you're currently attending or the school that you want to attend. No matter where you are in your life, there are many things you can do to significantly increase your chances of getting into a master's program, if that's what you want to do. First and foremost, if you're not applying for the upcoming cycle, start to diversify your resume. I typically don't recommend this for people who are applying within the next six months because it can look a bit disingenuous if you're starting new activities right before you're applying to a school. If you're a student, there are many things you can do besides just getting better grades, including internships, on-campus or off-campus research, or taking additional graduate level courses. If you're currently in the workforce, participating in independent projects or taking enrichment classes can help. Just just find ways to showcase your skills. It's all about showcasing your skills. Grades are an indicator of success to some extent, but raw talent doesn't always translate to straight A's. And one last thing I want to note is to always understand how you're going to fund your degree. I pay for my master's degree by TAing two classes over six quarters, and this covered my tuition and a living stipend, so I essentially got paid to complete my master's degree this way. That funding opportunity was very similar to those offered to PhD students. Often the funding opportunities that are available to PhD students, namely TA ships, are ships, fellowships, and scholarships are typically available for master's students as well, so definitely look into those funding opportunities if you're not sure where your funding is coming from yet. If you're in a research-based program, finding an RA ship related to your thesis work can be a game changer because you're essentially getting paid for doing work that you're already forced to do. That's it for this video. If you made it this far, thank you so much. Comment down below what you want to see on this channel. It helps me a lot when y'all tell me what you want to watch, and this video was actually inspired by a commenter, so thank you for that. I have a couple more videos coming up that were directly inspired by commenters for example a video on how i'm choosing my classes for next semester because i am finally taking classes after three years of peace so stay tuned for that if you like this video like comment and subscribe as always and i'll see you all in the next one later